Ed, I'm Erin Porter. Um, I'm an agricultural engineer at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College, and I am going to talk to you today to kind of set the stage and give you kind of an overview of Precision Ag and how you go about implementing Precision Ag on my farm. Whether this is a first time thing for you, you're not doing anything with Precision Ag, or whether you're kind of getting started in it and you want to know how to take it to the next level, um, I want to kind of provide that overview for you on how to actually implement Precision Ag on your operation. So the three big things that I want to cover today in this presentation is first make sure that we all have a really good understanding of what is Precision Ag. Right, it's a buzzword that's kind of tossed around quite a bit. I want to make sure everyone has a good understanding of what we mean when we say precision ag. Why do I need precision ag on my operation? Why does it make sense? And also, how do I get it started on my operation if I'm not doing any kind of precision ag right now? Or if I am doing precision ag, how do I get more out of it? So let's start with what is precision ag. If you do a quick Google search uh, and look up what is precision ag, and you look at the images, you get a lot of these kind of scary images that look super high tech with drones flying around, all these maps with different colors, you see robotics, uh, you see everything that's interconnected, and this can be really, really intimidating uh, for a producer that is not doing Precision Ag right now. Um, but I'm here to tell you Precision Ag can be really as simple or as complex as you want to make it, and there's a spot for Precision Ag on anybody's operation. So let's talk about some actual definitions of precision ag. Again, if you do a quick Google search on what is precision ag, some of the good definitions that I saw that I like that came up uh, first is precision ag is everything that makes the practice of farming more accurate and controlled when it comes to the growing of crops and raising livestock. So the big thing here is being accurate and controlled. Another one said that precision ag seeks to use new technologies to increase crop yields and profitability while lowering the levels of traditional inputs needed to grow crops. In other words, farmers are utilizing precision ag, are using less to grow more. And that's a really good, succinct definition, using less to grow more. Another definition said that the primary goal of precision ag is to strive for profitability, efficiency, and sustainability on the farm. This is achieved through a combination of precision ag technology and also precision ag equipment. You can kind of see the, the trends here on kind of getting an idea of what we mean when we say precision ag. The definition that I like to work with in my classroom is that it's managing crop production inputs on a site-specific basis in order to increase our profits, reduce our waste, and maintain environmental quality. So the big idea here is that we're managing everything on a site-specific basis with these goals in mind. Okay, notice there's nothing that says you have to be using drones, you have to be using robotics. All these are great tools that help us to accomplish precision ag, but precision ag itself is just a management strategy and that site-specific management strategy. So what I want you to think about is traditional ag versus precision ag and where we're going with precision ag. So if we think about traditional ag and we think about early farming, if I was a farmer um, back before mechanized agriculture, uh, my farm was very, very small scale, and with that, I could do really plant by plant management, uh, right? My, it was a subsistence farm. I could go out, look at all my plants individually, see what they needed, and applied exactly what they needed. Once we moved to mechanized agriculture, now we could cover a lot more ground, right? We went large scale, but what we lost by being able to do that was our plant by plant management. Now we're looking at a whole field management unit and we're missing some of the intricacies that can come with the variability in our fields. What Precision Ag does for us is keeps us large scale, which is what Mechanized Ag did for us, but allows us to start bringing that management unit back down to a subfield level. So Precision Ag is really helping us get back to that site specific management while keeping the benefits of being able to do large scale farming. So again, if we look at traditional farming versus precision farming, in traditional farming, we have whole field management approaches. Our field is treated as a homogeneous area that's all the same, and so all of our decisions are based on field averages. We're going out, we're collecting data, averaging them over the field, and then making a decision based on that. With this, our inputs are also applied uniformly. Whatever the field average says that that field needs, we're going out and applying that input. With precision farming, now we're doing the site-specific management approach. My field now can be treated as a heterogeneous area, meaning I've got different spots in the, in the same field. 
and I can break that field into different management zones into a subfield management management unit. And now my decisions can be based on site specific measurements and requirements of each zone. So now I'm still collecting the data that I'm collecting during traditional farming, but I'm doing so on a smaller scale to try to target those zones better. And with this now we can actually apply those inputs for specific zones according to the need of that zone. So hopefully this kind of clears up and gives you a clear picture of what we exactly mean when we say precision ag. And think about this as we go through the other panel discussions um, and how stuff fits into the whole overall management technique of precision ag. So next I wanted to cover why do I need precision ag? Why is this something that I need? So these are some pictures that I took from a small airplane. Uh, when I first moved to Georgia, I went up in an airplane to kind of look at Georgia ag from the air. Um, and these are some pictures that I took. I have no idea where I was in South Georgia, but I was somewhere in South Georgia um, and took these pictures. And I think these pictures do a great job of showing us why precision ag is so important, especially here in the Southeast. If you look at these pictures, there's a couple things that jump out. First, field shapes, right? We've got super irregular field shapes. We don't have nice square fields like we have uh, out in the Midwest. Next, we can see quite a bit of variability in this field. I can see differences in soil types. I can see differences in um, drainage areas and erosion. I can see differences in topography that change across that field. So with those changes, it would make sense to manage these areas differently and not the same across the entire field. So I think these pictures do a really good job of pointing out our variability in our fields and why we need precision ag in order to make the most with the least amount of inputs. So the big idea here is that you heard me mention a couple times when talking about those pictures for why I need precision ag. First and foremost is spatial variability. The definition of spatial variability is any variation in crop, soil, and environmental characteristics over distance and depth. So over the distance of my field from one corner of the field to another, I expect things to change and also depth into my field, depth into my soil, I expect things to change as well. Probably one of the easiest definitions or examples of spatial variability is soil types. So over here to the right, you can see within this one field, I have multiple soil types that all have multiple different drainage classes. We can see that in the aerial photo as well. And so this is going to lead to differences in my soil fertility, differences in my water holding capacity in these areas, uh, differences in how these areas should be managed just due to the natural spatial variability of my soils in that field. And anything that we think of can really vary spatially when it comes to agriculture across our field, across a single field, or even across multiple fields. The other type of variability that we try to manage with precision ag is temporal variability. Same definition as spatial variability, but now we're dealing with changes over time. Uh, so spatial means space, temporal means time. I know that not only do things change with space uh, and distance and depth, but I know things change in agriculture with time as well. Um, I can have things like rain totals changing with time. Things change with my seasons. Uh, ch things change uh, from day to day in terms of pest infestations and where they're at. And these two interact quite a bit. A lot of our variables change both spatially and temporally. And so the whole idea of precision ag is to be able to manage this variability that we know is inherent in the system, that we know is there. We've always known that there's lots of variability in our natural systems and in agriculture. Now we've got the tools necessary to start to manage it better. So it makes sense that we should be using precision ag. So we talked about what precision ag is, why we need it. Let's talk about how we actually make this happen. So this all sounds really good. So how do I actually get started? First, let me say again, precision ag can be as simple or as complex as you want. Don't be overwhelmed by all of the technology and all of the things that you see that are up and coming. Precision ag is just a management system, being able to make site-specific management decisions. So you can make this super simple or you can take it as complex as you want. So there's a spot along that continuum for everybody. My recommendation, especially if you haven't entered into the whole realm of precision ag, is to start really easy and simple, get your feet wet, and then start building over time and introducing new things and new technologies uh, as you feel comfortable. 
just like farming, I want you to think of precision ag as a cycle. In this case, it's a data cycle. So precision ag is all about the data. We have a data collection cycle, a data analysis, and then the resulting management decision. So we go out and collect the data on whatever we're trying to look at in the field. We look at that data and make some kind of actionable information from that data, do a data analysis and figure out what's going on, what's causing that variability in my field. And then we make a management decision based on that data. We go out, we implement it, and then we start all over again. We collect that data again, analyze it, make a management decision. So think about precision ag as a data cycle. It's a continuous cycle of data collection, data analysis, and that resulting management decision. And so we can kind of see this overlaid with our general cycle of farming itself, right? We've got a planting season where we do soil testing and data analysis from the previous harvest. We move into our growing season, our planting and growing season. With this, we're looking at all sorts of data as our plants grow looking at weather data, soil data, remote sensing data, doing variable rate management. These are all things that we're gonna talk about uh, with our next panel speakers. And then after the growing season, we move into the harvesting season. During this season, we're typically looking at yield monitoring, trying to see what we got off of that field based on the management decisions we made. And then the cycle starts all over again. We start planning for the next season. So we can kind of see how this cycle of precision farming is overlaid with the cycle of just farming uh, in general as well. So big takeaway here is think about precision ag as a data cycle. And as we go through the next panel presenters, I encourage you to think about what kind of data collection techniques they're talking about, the type of data they're talking about, and where it fits into this cycle in order to make an informed management decision. Because again, at the end of the day, that's what precision ag is, is a management system. So getting started. If I haven't done any precision ag so far on my farm, this looks great, sounds perfect, makes sense, and I wanna get started. Um, so some of the steps that I would take to get started and start implementing this in my operation. First, you've gotta collect that baseline data, right? That's our, our baseline data set that we can start to look at what our variability looks like across my field. So you wanna collect data in order to determine the amount of variability and also the causes of the variability across your field. So why is my field variable? What's driving that variability? Two of the biggest data sets we typically look at for this are soil sampling data and also yield data. These two data sets are fairly easy to get and can tell us a lot about the variability in our field. Once we have that baseline data collected, we can create basic management zones based on that data. So based on the variability that I see in my fields, I can create basic management zones and really focus on my high performing areas and my underperforming areas. Why are my high performing areas so good? And why are my underperforming areas not producing well? From there, we can really adjust my yield goals and have variable yield goals throughout my field. So I can really manage four variable yield goals throughout my field. And obviously this leads us into variable rate application, which we'll hear a little bit more about from some of our other panel discussions. From there, again, sticking with our data cycle, we wanna measure our results and our returns, implement my decisions that I made based on my management zones and my baseline data, measure the results, and then start that cycle over again. Again, it's a cycle of data collection, data analysis, and then the resulting management decision. Get going with this for a few years and create that kind of trend line and look at those trends over time, and then you can start taking it to the next step. So say I'm already doing this, I'm doing the basics of precision ag, I wanna take it to the next level, or I know I'm gonna to wanna to take it to the next level after I get into this and create those first few years of data. Taking it to the next level means getting more data. Remember that any kind of good decision-making requires good data. So the more data we have on what's going on on our farm, what's causing variability, and what the extent of that variability is, is gonna help us to make a more informed site-specific management decision. So we wanna to try to incorporate more data. There's tons of ways that we can start incorporating more data that ranges from super simple all the way up to super complex. So again, you can make precision ag as simple or as complex as you are comfortable with or as you want to. Some of the other types of data that we'll hear more about today um, are things like topography data, using soil moisture sensors, uh, during the growing season, 
uh, doing soil electrical conductivity mapping, doing remote sensing using UAVs, handheld sensors, tractor mounted sensors, uh, doing variable rate application or variable rate anything. Re really, we can vary the rate of anything out there right now. Uh, don't forget to look at the rate of return and some of the profit and cost mapping that you can do. Uh, and also looking at sensor networks. And we can start layering a lot of this data up and really start to get a great picture of what's going on in our field. Again, what's causing that variability and how I can manage that variability uh, to make a more informed site-specific management decisions. So with that, like I said, keep in mind throughout the rest of our panel discussions that precision ag is just a cycle of data collection data analysis, the resulting management decision, and then you start that cycle again. So think as we go through our, our panel discussion today um, about where the types of data that these guys are talking about fits into that cycle and how it's gonna connect the dots for us uh, in that cycle of precision farming. If you'd like to contact me, um, I've left my contact information here. I'd be happy to chat with you. And also any questions that you may have had, make sure you put those in the chat box uh, and we'll get to those here shortly. Hi, I'm uh, Alex McLemore, Assistant Professor of Agricultural Engineering at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about utilizing GPS technology on farm. All right, so kind of building upon the precision ag and oftentimes we think of GPS as that um, additional technology you may have to implement uh, precision agriculture. Um, so where are we at? The, the current status of GPS on farm. Um, it's been used commercially for over 20 years now, so it's pretty prevalent in the marketplace. Um, many of you all probably have GPS on your current equipment. So I'm really going to focus mostly on, on using that GPS on our equipment and in that precision ag setting. Um, even though we're, we're branching out a little bit beyond that, I'll talk about that towards the end. Uh, so primarily we're used for automatic guidance and steering, right? Allowing us to do those AV lines and operate the steering component of our operation, which is can reduce driver fatigue, right? And the operator can focus on quality of work. So now we can look at the different screens and make sure things are happening the way we want them to happen. Um, and then ultimately this, the goal there is to, to in, have increased yields and reduce costs, so maybe from reducing overlap um, in product input and stuff like that. And so this, those are kind of the current states of, of where we're at um, in terms of our application. So if we think a little bit more about what GPS is and currently what we have on our equipment, most of our modern systems are going to listen to multiple constellations. So when we say by listen, that means that, that they can, they can uh, detect or receive signals from different um, constellations, not just the GPS one. So we typically think of GPS as GPS, when re in reality, most of our modern receivers are going to be what we call a GNSS, or a Global Navigation Satellite System. And so that receiver on that globe we have on top is actually going to be able to pick up many different constellations, which is going to improve our accuracy. We can always see more satellites. So that's kind of the step one in improving our accuracy is let's just see as many satellites as we can. Um, and again, these modern systems, in addition to be able to see more satellites, right, so we can detect them and use them for positioning, we also uh, are gonna be picking up at least two frequencies. So if you're not real familiar with GPS, we have our satellites, you can see in the image there, we have our little satellites and they're broadcasting down this information and they're doing it on multiple channels. I often time to like to think of this as different radio stations, right? Your, your radio, you have a, a wide range of different stations that you can pick up. Um, in our GPS, we only have two radio stations. We have our L1 and our L2. And so we broadcast the same information on both of those um, different frequencies. And that just allows us to improve accuracy. They have different characteristics. And so we can account for different types of air. So all of our modern stuff is going to be working with this. Um, and that really is going to help us be able to get our position. So when we think about precision ag, that main thing we want to talk about is site-specific management. And when we look at site, right, underline site there, we're thinking of location from GPS. All right, we're thinking of location from GPS. We can think of that as GNSS. Uh, we, so to do that, we want consistent and accurate GPS. Right? That is critical for us to be able to take our application 
prescriptions and actually apply them or take that as applied information. So we have to have that good location. And kind of the current status here on our, our positioning and correction services. If we're looking at just GPS alone, which is you know, free for us to pick up once we have our equipment, about 30 feet, um, worst case scenario. We do have our satellite-based differential augmentation, which is gonna be free, um, but you're only at the 15. So most of what uh, we think about on precision ag are gonna be the, the lower two here. So the, the satellite-based kinematic augmentation and then that local base station kinematic, right? So I'm gonna talk about these two separately just a little bit. When we think about the six inch accuracy on our satellite ones, this is a technology that's been around for a while, but has progressed quite a bit recently, where we're actually having um, paid for services. So from your different providers are sending down signals from satellites to do your correction services on. And they say that, you know, so six inches or so is what they're claiming. Um, these are gonna be more intermittent than what your standard kind of local base station type RTK. Um, and they are definitely pushing towards in the future to have these satellite-based kinematic augmentations, but they're still not quite to that, that inch level accuracy that we're expecting when we, we think of our precision ag applications. Um, and so for those, we're looking more at the local base station kinematic, and we often think of that as RTK, so that real-time kinematic. And these are always gonna be, for the most part, a paid service. You can set these up on your own, but really your, your best option is to go for these paid service for the services and the technology can get pretty advanced. But I wanna talk about two things when it comes to how we get this sub inch accuracy is what we're really that, it's kind of that backbone of precision ag and our guidance and our, our placing location with our data. Um, and so there's two main ways. The first one here, this is the one that most of us are familiar with. So if you're working with your local dealer um, you're going to have this local network of base stations. So in your area, you're working with your dealer, you have this ground radio communication um, that's going to be on your equipment. So you see the globe there. And it's pretty standard across all of them, all the different companies, where you're going to have a radio that attaches to your globe or is integrated into your, your globe or your receiver. And that radio can communicate directly with the radio tower from your local provider. All right. And so your correction services are coming directly to you. That's what's allowing you to have it. These are generally within five to 10 miles. All right. That's what, that's what makes this correction so beneficial. Um, this has been the standard for quite a while. We think of RTK, but there is a new technology that's really starting to emerge in the field that is worth talking about. And so we're starting to replace the radio component of it by using the internet. All right. Um, and this has some benefits, uh, but the general way that this works is we're getting correction services so we can get that one inch accuracy from um, intro. So again, I know we're talking about on farm. A lot of what we do is we have to be able to collect this data, do our guidance on the farm. We need to have good service where we're at in all of our fields um, and all of our different issues that we may come across. And so one of the new solutions again is this what we call Intrip or Network Transport of RTCM via internet protocol. Right, there's a lot going on there. That's one of the things about GPS, a lot of acronyms, a lot of long words. But the basic thing here is now we're starting to get this with the internet. So now we have different options on our service providers and how we can get that into the tractor cab. All right, so that graphic does a pretty good job. We still have our local base stations. These base stations are streaming to a computer. That computer is sending it up to the internet. And then basically we're using cell service to get it into the tractor cab. This has pros and cons because we don't always have cell service where we're working, right? But now it opens up that additional option. So if, you, if you're not using the radio-based RTK, you can actually use this internet base. If you don't get one, you may want to consider the other one. So now on the farm, we have more than one way that we can get our RTK correction services. We're no longer limited by the radio. We can now look at these internet options. Um, again, there's pros and cons of both, depending on where you're at and what your service connectivity is for either one of those. Um, just talk a little bit about what companies are offering these and what they're called as those different companies. And this list is not all inclusive, but I like to include this just to give a little bit of an update on, you know, what are some of those prevalent companies that make uh, GNSS uh, receivers that have intrip capabilities and pretty much all of them nowadays do. And again, this isn't every company out there, but I try to include many. 
um, including their, so in this table over on the far left, we have our company name. The next column is gonna be the GNSS name. So for example, I think the most recent John Deere one is a Starfire 6000. And then the correction service, this is specific to the in-trip service. I think most of us and many of us that are using RGK are familiar with the base station one that's run by your local network or your local dealer. Um, but the in-trip, is oftentimes maybe more on a corporate level. And so this is the, the name. So if you're interested in some of them actually you can use a generic in trip, but some of them um, I've listed the main service. So like for Ag Leader, Digifarm is gonna be the main service. Um, and it's the same for Novatel, it's gonna be Digifarm. So it's an internet based correction. So all you gotta do there is have internet in the cab. You can do that over your phone if you needed to. Um, even John Deere is in this game. They have the mobile RTK, it's what their solution is called. Um, and so you could actually have, have that on there instead of the radio, or you could potentially run both. And so then you'll notice that the case, Raven, Topcon, or not Topcon, but Trimble, are all have, I think the predominant one is what we call Slingshot RTK. It's been around for a while, pretty well proven um, option. And again, it's a, an internet base. And so these are add-ons that you get that gives you that alternative method versus our traditional radio. Um, talk a little bit about why you would want this. I've talked a lot about in-trip and I'm including this because, um, you know, through, through what I do uh, in terms of keeping up with this technology, I keep seeing more and more of this and these companies keep providing more and more options. Um, and it may not be a single solution, right? But we're not necessarily saying that we're gonna have one solution that's gonna be in-trip only. It may be a combination because if we think about precision ag and it becomes more important to know where our data is, so that we can use that and get value out of our data so we can improve our operation. We want to be able to have that signal all the time. Um, and so what Intrip is allowing, and, and this graphic shows here, which this graphic is from Deere's website, they're talking about how if we have our standard one, which is going to be on the left, our radio RTK, um, you just have kind of that single, um, single radio uh, connectivity sending from our tower to our um, to our equipment and you can that can be blocked by trees buildings whatever it may be but when you go to the mobile rtk that technology is pretty well established in terms of our mobile phone if you're in location of quality cell network you can have a pretty well coverage on that so it's not as impaired by some of our obstacles that we may encounter in the field but again you could couple this with the radio you could couple this with those satellite-based paid services, and we start to progress to a system that can pick and choose on which correction service is gonna be the best and make sure you stay connected. All right, so it's kind of the way we're moving is we have more and more options, and maybe we need to combine those multiple options together, and we're gonna guarantee we have the best solution. Um, and you know, in addition to having our you know, inch level accuracy directly over the internet, we have some kind of additional features that we may want to think about when we have that internet in the cab, right? Now we can easily sync data. We can pull in background maps really easily. We can actually get machine to machine communication. So that's one of the futuristic things If this machine is talking to that machine and they can know where they're at. They can run at the same speeds, right? You can, you can do different things like that. Fleet management is becoming a big deal, definitely on these larger operations. Um, and I say ready for future services. Um, I think part of why these companies are rolling these technologies out is they know that you're going to have the internet connectivity in the cab in the future. And so then you can use that on your farm in more than one way. So it's a value added service. So if you're going to go ahead and have internet in the, in the cab, um, not only can you run your phone off of that internet, um, but you can in your GPS off of it, but now you can start to do other things that they may uh, have in the future, including service calls and fixing the software and stuff like that. Um, so talked a little bit about the, the migration and where the technology is heading and where we're getting our correction services. Let's talk a little bit about how we can use our data um, to benefit us on farm. And so some of the applications, and I think this is more on the higher level applications. So it's no longer just thinking about AB lines and guidance. Let's think about all the value that our GPS um, data is and that's being recorded for us. All right, so how can we get more out of that data? Um, our data is more than just latitude and longitude. It's not just position on where we're at in the field. 
when we go through, we are recording, or the monitor is recording a lot of different data, including elevation, speed, acceleration, um, among other things. There are lots of others. It's including uh, GPS status, all right? And, and lots of other terminology for GPS. It tells us what kind of quality we have and stuff like that. And so I've included here um, three maps of just raw data that's coming off of, um, I believe this came off of a combine. So if we're thinking about yield, and where we're getting our yield and what kind of impact we may have, we can look at our raw information. So the, the left image there is going to be, that left map is going to be elevation. And I call it raw because those are the individual points. You can start to see trends in there where our red is our lower area and our greens are higher area. We're going to talk more about that in a second. Um, our next map there is just our GPS status. And I show that just because if you're having issues, you're seeing anomalies uh, among some of your data or you're having issues with guidance, it may be related to this. You, this is actually being recorded in the background that we can use a lot of this information. Um, and then the very, uh, the far right map there is gonna be our speed. So you can see here as we speed up, slow down. And this may give you good insights into field conditions, operator fatigue, um, different analysis that we may be able to use and pull value out of that GPS data that we didn't know was there before. All right, so let's take this data and, and look at how we can take value. So we're gonna look at our elevation information and we're going to actually, I'm going to show a little bit of an analysis tied with the elevation. And so one thing we can do is we call terrain analysis. We do topographic maps and identify wetness potential. Um, and just so real quick, these three maps throw, show a progression. So the left, that's going to be our elevation map or a topographic map showing contour. Uh, those redder areas are lower and the green areas are higher. As we move to the right, that center map is a wetness potential. The green areas are higher areas of wetness, right? And the red are drier areas. It's a combination of, if you look between our elevation map and our wetness map, right? You can start to see, especially if you look in that um, upper left corner, there's those green areas. That's essentially the drainage path. So as we get a lot of drainage, the wetness potential goes up. Right. We have a lot of green in the middle of the map. That's because that area is flat, so it's not going to drain as well. So we can use this information. And if we look all the way to the far right, that's actually our yield map. You know, start to see similarities where we have red is lower yield, green is higher yield. So in those drainage um, areas, we're actually starting to see lower yield. Right. So you can take this GPS data and take it to the next level and see how it's, made in, it's impacting our yield and see if we don't have year to year correlation and start thinking about site specific. So maybe we need to plant differently. Maybe we need to put tile into those areas or maybe they need to be managed as a different crop altogether. Um, so this is a, how we can take that GPS data and start moving into more and more site specific or precision ag applications. Um, so just wrapping up here, we talked about that. What's the future of GPS? We're gonna be seeing new signals coming. So we have the L1, L2. L5 is on the way, so it's just better accuracy is what we're looking at. Um, the other thing is we're looking now at actual implement guidance. So no longer um, trying to follow the tractor. We're actually now going to put a globe on the implement, and we're going to use that um, as our, our AV line. And so it's going to be improvement on slopes, soft soils, where you may be moving around, and even in your turns, you make sure your implement is where you want it, not necessarily the tractor itself. Um, and then again, I already mentioned, you know, a lot of internet connectivity, fleet management tracking, you know, that office equipment data syncing, um, really tied in to the need for the RTK on our system from our GPS. And the last two here are really thinking big picture. Um, you know, robotics are coming. I'm sure there's many vendors associated uh, with the conference that are looking at robotics and using those robotics oftentimes relies heavily on GPS. And we're seeing pretty um, high increases in funding for these ag technology and they're going to be using GPS and all that data can be used um, to benefit us. Um, and I will say there's many opportunities for fruit and vegetable production, partially because much of what we see on the GPS has been developed and implemented on kind of our traditional grain based row crop systems. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to start to adapt all that data that we're picking up from our GPS into our fruit and vegetable uh, operations. 
I just want to thank, thank you all for um, attending and, and watching. We'll be here for questions. Again, my name is Alex McLemore. There's my email address. Um, I'm at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College. Um, and again, thank you for attending the conference. All right, now I'm Wes Porter back again, um, and I'm going to discuss the introduction kind of precision soil sampling and applications with you today. So we're going to step through just kind of a broad overview and keep in mind at the end, you know, we'll have an opportunity for the live Q&A. So kind of take some notes during my talk, and if there's anything that kind of piques your interest, make sure you notate that and we'll kind of work through it. So when we start talking about soil sampling, you know, typically what we do in a field is we'll pull a composite soil sample from one field and we'll send it to a lab for soil testing. Results should be or are usually based on a crop, a yield goal, and some other field parameters that we enter into that result. Once the results are received, then we'll get a fertilizer blends ordered and applied to the field based on that yield goal. So this is the most common practice and I'm gonna say, you know, why is it a problem? And I think you're starting to see the common theme here is variability across farms and fields and issues that we run into. So, if we want to just quickly look at the picture here, this is a, taken out of the same field, um, same amount of fertilizer rates applied to this crop across this field, and we just see that we're unable to achieve the biomass and yield development in that. So we just don't, don't develop that plant the way we would in, um, because of field variability, whether that's soil type, whether that's something else going on, texture, water holding capacity, a lot of things that are going on. So how do we address that? And so to better address it, we start looking at um, trying to match fertility applications to crop requirements in a more intensive soil sampling strategy. So there's three ways to do it. Hopefully we're already doing composite samples from the field. If we're not, we really do need to start doing composite samples from the field. One single point sample is not doing us any good from that particular field. Next, we can look at grid soil sampling. And then if we wanna advance even further, we can look at zone sampling. I'm gonna step you through each one of those in the talk moving forward. So for grid sampling, we simply lay, overlay a grid on the field and collect samples from that grid. Ideally, we're gonna pull composite samples from each of the grid cells. Again, we don't pull a single point. So we'd go around and pull anywhere five, six, up to 10 samples from each grid around in it, take and aggregate those in a bucket or a container, and then take that aggregate sample and send that off. And so then each of the soil tests were formed by the composite sample from each grid. And then we develop an application map based on that. So how do we select appropriate grid size? And so first field size is part of that, application equipment limitations is part of that, the variability in the field, the cost associated with it. So I do wanna keep in mind that each one of those samples you're pulling from each grid, there's a soil sample cost associated with that. So, you know, I've, I've heard it said, and a colleague of mine has said that the quarter acre is the size we need to be at. That's where we capture all variability in the field. We know that that's not realistic for a big production scale. We may not be able to do that. So more standardly, we hear the terms 2.5, 5, and 10 acre grids that are overlaid on the field. And so, you know, it just depends on where you're at. If you've never sampled before, you probably want to start with a smaller grid size. And then as you start to see where the variability in that field is, we can increase that grid size from that two and a half of the five and maybe 10 acres over time and see where it's at. Well, unfortunately, grid samples can miss some field variability because again, we're just overlaying a grid on top of that field. You can kind of see that map to the top left. Those are just typical soil types. You can see that grid encompasses multiple soil types within that field. And, you know, we may, have some areas that are not well representative or maybe treating areas in a particular field wrong because of the way the grid falls across it. And then if we're not careful and we improperly size the grid, we can, we can make, create variability where it's not there. Or like I said earlier, we can miss variability. And so you can see the soil pH, that bottom map, if we do a one acre grid versus a 2.5 acre grid, we really see a lot of differences that are happening between the two of those. We're capturing more variability, but maybe too much for us to really control in that one acre maybe that 2.5, we may have missed some. So we kind of have to decide what works best for us. So we're looking at grid sampling. Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. And we kind of went through some of that. But one, you access the nutrient variability in the field. If you don't have any prior knowledge of the field history, we don't need that. We just overlay the grid size on it based on what we want to do. We typically do identify some sort of hot spots or issue areas within that field that really need some attention minimize excess nutrient application. We target inputs where they're needed and there's minimal skill level needed to do this. 
Um, some disadvantages, there's really no justification for grid sizes or grid placement sometimes on the field. Um, both of those, we're just kind of placing it there and we're, we're picking a grid size and going with it. We do ignore soil properties and characteristics on the field sometimes. They can be labor and time intensive and it can be expensive sometimes if we go really small grids and we send off a ton of samples. So how do we move beyond grid sampling? What else can we do there to really start to target some other, other things? And so that's um, a targeted variability via zone management. So unlike grid sampling, zone sampling develops zone based on another measured field parameter. I think in some of the previous talks, you've heard a little bit about some of this, and we're gonna look at some of the other field parameters that we can talk about. There's multiple ways to delineate these zones, and you need to know that a specific area is different than other areas, and it comes usually from previous observations. So this is gonna be in a field that we do have levels of data from that we can build upon. So a measured difference between the areas, so that can be visual, can be soil type, soil EC, elevation, yield data, any other layer that you might can think of. And so we're gonna look at a few of these as we move forward. This is just an example field um, that we look at here in South Georgia. And you can see all our different soil type maps there. I just quickly pulled this from the web soil survey. I'm not saying this is the end all do all. You can look in there and see where some of those soil types are a perfect fit. You can see where some variability shows up and is not necessarily captured by soil type. But this is a layer of data that we can use. So just keep that in mind. Some other data we can use from the soil type is soil EC or electroconductivity. There's a bunch of different ways to measure that. There's a Varus machine. There's also an EM machine that can measure that. That happens to be the Varus machine in the top left corner you can see. And so we can see where we start using some of these fields and matching some of them up with our soil EC and some other observations we see in the field. In addition to electroconductivity, we can check elevation. So in this case, if we've done any operations with a high resolution GPS, as you learned in the previous talk, in the field, we've collected elevation data. So we can look at the elevation data, compare it to yield, compare it to something else and see, are there special correlations between the two? And in this particular case, you can notice some of them, some of the lower elevation, we have some lower yields, mainly because we have water sources back in that field or low areas that stay wet a long time in that particular field. So here's another thing we can look at. A lot of times in the Southeast, our soil electroconductivity is very strongly related to yield. And so we can see in this case, we've got a soil electroconductivity map up top, a cotton yield map at the bottom, and we can see the very strong visual correlation between the two. And additionally, in this particular field, we've got a soil type map that's overlaid in the top right corner. And we see that follows the soil EC map very, very well in this particular case. And so this is kind of one of your picture perfect fields. However, if we look at the graph in the bottom right corner, we see in this case, as we increase soil EC, we see a decrease in yield. So we've actually found another problem here. We can use uh, soil EC to identify other issues. In this particular case, we had a saline and sodic problem. So the higher the salt content, the higher the soil EC. So that kind of shows us that we were able to identify that in that particular field. The higher the saline problem, that means that our yields were reduced. So we used EC for a totally different reason in this particular case, but we could do some zone management with it. So we look at zone development, a lot of times it starts with some sort of grid development, as you see here, as a grid developed, and then we create zones from it as we start to identify areas that are like or dissimilar. And so you can kind of look at these two pictures for just a moment and see how the zones on the right were created from the grids on the left and how they're used for a control map for an application. So let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of zone sampling for just a moment. So zones are delineated based on past field performance and soil properties. They classify spatial variability, reduce time and labor, and they can become more economical because we're not pulling a ton of samples off this field. We've identified areas that are variable within the field, and now we're going to just those areas and pulling soil samples from them. Some of the disadvantages is it can be a greater initial time and investment to implement the zone management. That means that we have to have some sort of other technology or data layer or multiple layers that we're utilizing to create these zones with, whatever that may be. I've, I've mentioned a lot of those earlier. You know, soil texture, soil EC, yield, elevation, on and on and on. A lot of times there's a higher skill level required here because we are layering data and we're trying to pull in a lot of different information. And then because of that, we do need to know some field knowledge and field history in there that kind of is coupled with this. So let's talk about when to use each one of these. You know, and maybe this is your take home message. If, if you're not doing anything beyond a composite sample right now, you can walk away and try to make a decision on how you're going to intensify that management on your farm. 
So if you're just doing a composite, maybe a grid sample is the way you want to go because you don't need very much to little information on the field of history. We know there's variability expected, but we still don't know that history. Difference in soil type or varied management practices have been used in the past. And an important data layer when we start to implement some sort of zone management future fertilizer applications. We can start layering that and creating this information. Now, if we want to go to zone sampling, the field history is known for at least three to five years, somewhere there. That means we may have yield data for at least three plus years. We may have collected some sort of other data on that field. Maybe we've got variable topography on that field. We can use it. Again, I mentioned yield data, they're, they're consistent spots. That's what was really there. Is we consistent across some of these zones that we're starting to see. And if we see variable zones, it's really hard to pin down why they're variable. But if we're consistently low, consistently high, we know something else is going on. And if you've got any other data layer, we talked about a lot of those to overlay and help define these zones. That's when we use zone sampling. So why do we use precision soil sampling in general? We use that to move from precision soil sampling to a variable rate fertilizer application. We hope that we're going to better target our field needs. And so what we're really looking at is creating a control map like you see to the right. And even though this map is laid off in grids, you can see the pretty clear zones that we could create within that map. We've, in this case, decided to use five rates. We would put this in a controller and we've got and apply these different rates to this particular field. And you can see in the future, we can start creating zonal control zones here where we start subsampling our soil at a more larger scale instead of in each one of those zones that you see in the field there, or grids you see in the field there. So what this map does is provides where and how much information to apply um, the product at the for the variable rate equipment. We use some sort of AgGIS software to create it with. Then we're linking the soil test recommendations to the appropriate grid or zone. And so we can see where we start to create those. So again, I want to thank you for your attention. To listen to this portion of the panel and the talk. Um, and just a little bit, we can, um, we can start to discuss the live Q&A. So if you've got any questions about my talk, stick around. We'll be on at the end of the talks and we'll discuss those. So again, thank you and we'll talk to you soon. Good day, my name is Simerji Work. Uh, I'm an Extension Precision Ag Specialist at University of Georgia, and today I will be talking about um, the spray control system and technologies in precision ag. And while I'm presenting this, please feel free to take any notes or put your question in the chat box so we can discuss those or we can answer those during the Q&A session at the end of the, all the specialist presentations at the end of the panel. So when we talk about precision uh, spray technologies, uh, look at some of the current trends, what's going on right now. Uh, time for getting the field operation, especially uh, spraying operations is getting more and more critical every season, especially in the south here as growers are spraying more and more crops. And something that definitely uh, happened in the last three to four years is that the increase in the spray equipment size. Our boom sprayers are anywhere from 90 to even 140, 50 feet currently. And some of the, the, the orchard or the tree sprayers I usually call even the vertical swath on that is increased significantly anywhere from 10, 20 feet to 50 feet. We're not operating at the nominal speeds anymore of five to 20, oh, five, <clears throat> five, 10 miles. We're with some of the self-propelled high sprayers we're driving at 12 to 16 miles. And there's more and more emphasis on accuracy and uniformity of the spray performance or the sprayer that relates to spray rate, application rate, and coverage. And then also as the technology is advancing, we're seeing more and more machine vision or sensors being integrated into the sprayer side where we're again, our target is to have a better product application and overall, we're moving towards this machine automation where different technology is available to automate different type of functions on the machines. So when I talk about this great technologies today, I'm, I'm gonna focus kind of more, uh, not just on the boom sprayers, but also some that is available for orchards and peace tree sprayers to see what all technologies are available for the orchard or tree sprayers, but also for the produce on the boom sprayers. So some of the needs, why we do we need precision technology is that our conventional spray system, um, when we look at that, they're just not very accurate at 
the application accuracy. We have some high off rate errors. They are unable to compensate for ground speed changes. We got significant flow and pressure variations. And we also have the, not have the ability to turn the sections on and off as we go through different sections. That kind of makes the whole application highly inefficient and non-uniform. So that's why we, we, we have seen these different type of spray technologies being adopted on the sprayer systems where I usually tend to divide those into standard and advanced. On the standard, we have like a rate control or section control, but we also have some more advanced to really kind of make those applications more precise, whether it's from the application rate, pressure, or even the spray coverage. So we talk about rate controller, it's a very a must have technology usually I say, because like I said earlier, what a rate controller does is it tends to maintain your target application rate as we travel through the field. And although this technology is a little slow to be adopted on the orchard or the air blast sprayers, but it's still available nowadays for both boom sprayers and orchard sprayers. We we'll talk about section control. Um, basically, we can think of section control as that as we are driving through the previously sprayed or no spray zones in the in the field that we can turn these different sections on and off. So we're not over applying the product where it's not needed. And this technology again is uh, available for both the boom sprayers and even on some of the on uh, the vertical boom or the orchard sprayers where the nozzles are configured into different three, five, or seven different sections. So a little bit of advance from the section control is actual individual nozzle control. So which where the concept is the same that you're turning the sections on and off the sprayer, but instead of turning the sections, now we're trying to be more precise by turning the individual nozzles on and off. And the concept is same that we're able to control each nozzle so we can reduce that over application and here, in this case, this technology is kind of more prevalent on the boom sprayers, but it's also a little bit expensive now. On this, each section acts as a nozzle. Each nozzle acts as a section on the boom now, and which means that instead of using a flow control or section control valves, we're using the solenoids on each nozzle to turn it on and off as we need. So I'm gonna talk about a couple couple systems or technologies that are very particular to the tree or orchard sprayer. So this one right here is usually we call a smart spray, which can be any type of visual, infrared or ultrasonic sensors. The idea here is something similar to turning the sections on and off on a boom sprayer, but usually here, or especially in an orchard or tree crop, instead of just having the spray constantly on all the time. We're using some sort of visual infrared or ultrasonic sensors to turn the spray on and off as the sprayer approaches the tree. And usually there's a 25 to 40% of savings that have been linked to while using this technology instead of doing conventional rates. But something a little bit more advanced of that um, smart spray system is, is usually another intelligent spray or another version of a smart spray control system is using a combination of visual or LIDAR mapping. Here, instead of just turning the sections on and off, we're targeting even the product rate to be specific to the canopy. So usually the sensors help in mapping the tree height and canopy where the spray volume can be adjusted on the go so that the lower trees are getting a lower rate, whereas the higher canopies, denser canopies are getting more volume, more rate as and when needed. Drift management nozzles, again, these are a little bit more prevalent on the boom sprayers, for, so more for produce guys. As we have more and more concerns about drift, uh, especially in the sensitive crops or areas, um, the nozzle manufacturers are coming up with improved designs where some of those are like specially air induction nozzles where 
uh, we're still able to maintain some of the finer droplets or the medium to coarse droplets that were need for improved coverage would be oh, they're using the air induced air in the nozzle so that uh, it, it, they're not as driftable as some of the very fine particles. So one of the take home messages from these is also from the diff is the growers need to be selective with the type of nozzles and not just utilize one nozzle from all the way early in the application to all the way later in the season. Uh, this is another advanced technology available for boom sprayers, the pulse width modulation. So one problem that we usually have even when using the rate controller is that rate controller is able to compensate for the speed changes by adjusting the pressure or flow. So when, well, when the rate controller adjusts flow by changing the pressure, it affects the nozzle pattern and the droplet size. So the spray coverage and efficacy was getting uh, affected. So the workaround around that was that these uh, manufacturers came up with the pulse width modulation where instead of a spray nozzle being on all the time, as indicated in the picture below, there is a pulsing solenoid on the nozzle to control the flow and which means that we can uh, attain a constant pressure and to meet the application rate, the pulsing solenoid has, we can vary the duty cycle in the frequency where the pressure remains the same, but we're able to achieve different application rates at a constant pressure just by varying the duty cycle. What we're getting with all these technologies is today is having the ability to have all these sensors and visual guidance systems. We're moving towards this automation and spray system. While we're still a little, um, I would say behind on the automation on the boom sprayer side, there's a lot of technologies currently being evaluated, but we still have the automated sprayers available for orchards and tree crops the spray you see here is actually through GOES, the Global Unmanned Spray System, the, com the company out of California, and it's a fully automated spray system, which has all the sensors, vision, guidance system to operate without any human interface or human intervention during applications. And it has, like I said, the sense and spray technology where it only comes on when it sees the text, the trees, and some of the newer designs even have the variable rate spray capabilities where it's able to sense the canopy density and tree height to match the spray volume exactly to, to that. So the point here is that we're not too far away from seeing these many more uh, uh, as, as more technology and computing systems get advanced. So we better, be aware that these technologies are advancing pretty fast so we need to make sure that some of these technologies are really useful for not just being more efficient applications but also for uh, more precise applications. So uh, when we talked about that I showed some of the technologies that were uh, that are available or going to be available so if you're a grower producer being a vegetable or um, fruit producer, whether you're using a boom sprayer or something, um, boom sprayer or, or orchard sprayer, you need to think about some of the technology considerations are that there are must have technologies which we usually call the start with basic technology options if you don't have anything. So that would be your rate and section control that are some of the basic technologies that you can implement that can have big savings and return on investment pretty quickly. The second cheap things are nozzles are cheap compared to the other hardware and software on sprayers. So you can be selective with nozzles and change nozzles, but also use nozzles that are recommended for the right type of application. And further, when you're looking at adopting any other technology that whether it's a vision or optical sensor or the variable rate application, you need to be thinking about what type of savings you would achieve by adopting that technology, but also what type of return on investment that technology would provide. 
even further thinking about if you're thinking about smart or intelligence spray systems now those are the systems where you need to think about your acres that you will be covering to justify the investment in that sort of technology and then on the automation before you think too far think about some of the options that are already available such as drones for visual imaging and other that you can utilizing before making decisions of making uh investing into autonomous sprayer or looking at some of that technology that's all i have for uh today but i would be available for the live q and section and like i said feel free to drop any questions in the chat box or or uh, feel free to answer or ask them directly to us when we're available or uh, during the live q and a section look forward to hearing from you guys hi everybody I'm Charles Barrett with the University of Florida, and I'm just going to give you a brief summary today about what I do working on irrigation scheduling with soil moisture sensors. Uh, this is me out standing in a zucchini field back in the day when I was a young guy. Um, just to show, I've been working on soil moisture sensors and irrigation scheduling for quite a little bit of time here. Um, and I'll skip to my next slide here and just show that when I think of irrigation and I think of uh, irrigation scheduling, what pops in my mind is this picture on the left here of this irrigation schedule where crops start off small using less water and as the season goes on, they use more and more water. And these schedules like this are super useful because they'll give you a ballpark of, of how much water your crop should be using at X days after planting. On the right side of the screen, you'll see soil moisture sensors. This is just a few of them that I've picked out. And um, these types of sensors take that schedule and just fine tune it so I can pick up things on these sensors and learn where my root zone is and how much irrigation water I just put out and how deep it went by looking at my sensors and use that to fine tune what my irrigation schedule tells me I should be applying. And so what that kind of looks like is these sensors uh, on the left hand side of your screen, you'll see my hand and some sensors. And then in this middle data display area, you see a graph with uh, five lines on it, a red, a black line, red line, blue line, that type of thing. Um, each one of those lines represents one sensor going deeper down in the soil profile. And over here on the right side of the screen, we'll see we got roots. And, and so from there, this is how the interface happens. Your sensor's right down there in where your roots are and we're monitoring where your roots are taking up water and how much water the roots are taking up. Um, and so this next slide here, I'm just kind of giving you a brief overview before I got into sensors and, and how they all worked. I wanted to ground truth whether or not what they tell me is, is represented in reality. So I did this little test with blue dye and I irrigated different amounts and I, and I monitored how deep the blue dye went and, and um, I'll get into this in more detail in my actual talk, but this is kind of what I did first to ground truth the technology and see if it works. And it did and, and then where the, where the blue dye ended up is and where the moisture was picked up on the sensor all made perfect sense as to, um, does the sensor represent reality? And, and so I answer that question, yes, it does. Um, and in Florida, we've got a statewide soil moisture sensor network where um, I've got a bunch of sensors that I lend out with my county extension agents. There's a picture of me installing one with a county agent down in South Florida. We've got sensors all over the state and we're helping our producers to use these sensors to make uh, better irrigation decisions. Um, I've also been a, been lucky enough to work with one or two growers up in Georgia and a, and a good soil moisture sensor vendor up there in, in Georgia. And so um, I know that this technology can be helpful and, and it can be helpful in Florida and Georgia. And so I appreciate your time and, and I'll talk more in depth about that in my talk. And hopefully we can get into some of these details in the panel. I appreciate it. Hello, this is Glenn Rains. I'm uh, going to give you a presentation on um, automation and how you might be able to integrate that into your uh, system, into your uh, growing system, or uh, look at also some of the 
automation systems that we have coming in the future. Um, you know, I think, you know, previously we've we've talked about these uh, automation. I'm, I'm going to talk about automation and robotics and, and maybe uh, semi-autonomous, you know, kind of in the same uh, vein. But um, a lot of the talk I've done previously is about this is a future endeavor. And and actually, we, we were getting to the position now where we're talking a, a, a a lot about um, what you can do now. Um, so what I've done is I've broken this up, this talk up into uh, a few segments. One is, is, is basically automation and uh, how it can fulfill several purposes. So these different purposes I'm going to uh, describe and um, I'm going to look at, uh, you know, some of these things I'll talk about them in one section, but they overlap. You know, some things are efficient, reduce time, reduce labor. They all do those things, but I'm going to kind of limit my talk about them in, in, into certain categories. So some of the things that we can talk about are uh, replacing uh, labor uh, or that do repetitive or dangerous tasks. Um, this helps reduce reliance on labor and also helps uh, reduce uh, safety issues, uh, make current operations more efficient. So we can uh, look at uh, automation and semi-autonomous systems that help uh, uh, make uh, operations more efficient. Um, we'll talk about uh, management strategy, strategies and how we can uh, incorporate, you know, more precision management and also use this new technology to maybe incorporate more organic production. And then also how we can, uh, you know, replace, uh, uh, you know, human or, or a time drain and these time consuming tasks can help free your mat you uh, farmers and, and to, to, to more of the management and uh, day to day operations. So repetitive operations, uh, some of the things that, uh, will, that that's out there now are there's some picking or harvesting systems. Uh, this top uh, image here on the top right is an agrobot uh, strawberry harvester. It's one of the companies that began coming out with autonomous strawberry harvesting and this is one of their units. They have two or three different uh, units out there. Bottom right here is from the Harvest Crew uh, Robotics, which is out of Florida, so it's kind of a local outfit. Um, there's also uh, quite a bit of research up in the Northwest now looking at apple harvesting and um, a lot of research going into that. There are harvest assistance systems out there. Um, they're being researched, which is, you know, as one flavor of that is say, is a little, a robot or a little uh, cart that goes back and forth between the, uh, where the picking is going on and where the truck is. So it eliminates having to walk back and forth um, to uh, reduce time to, to harvest. Spraying can be repetitive if, uh, you know, you're going out there once every couple of weeks. Um, and there's uh, definite systems out there to uh, do that. And I'll talk about that more under a different uh, heading. Um, and then other things that are very repetitive are like uh, sorting, grading, sizing. Um, there's a lot of uh, machine vision systems out there now for sorting uh, fruits like blueberries and strawberries and that sort of thing by uh, uh, size and, and grading. Um, some of the larger vegetables and, and kind of the ones that are not, don't have regular shape and size are still hand sorted. Um, so there's still some opportunity uh, to advance in that with machine vision and robotics, which is being you know, examined by, by people all over the world. Also, a, a, a neck, uh, we don't talk a lot about the safety aspects, but um, automation and robotics also will help reduce risk of injury uh, or uh, severe uh, severe injury, reduce exposure to chemicals through the use of things like autonomous spraying where you don't, uh, you're not out there with the, with the spray, uh, reducing exposure to the sun. Um, we all like working outdoors, but uh, continuous exposure uh, can have detrimental effects as is shown in this image with man that drove a uh, bending truck for 40 years. And, and you can see the the, the toll it, the sun took on the left side of his face is exposed to it continuously. Um, we can reduce exposure to de dangerous equipment um, and also reduce strain on back, legs, and arms. Uh, you know, uh, laborers that are picking 
Um, it's not an easy job and, and uh, you know, depending on whether you're stooping over all day or reaching up all day, um, we can either use uh, some autonomous picking mechanisms or there's also uh, some research now where and some and some commercial systems where they where workers use exoskeletons which help to this is mainly for picking up heavy equipment or heavy boxes and things like that that relieve your stress on the back um, but I can see this going towards you know other other types of systems where it's an assistive uh, device for the, the, the worker to reduce uh, strain on different parts of the body. Um, improving efficiency is always a big one. Um, one uh, key application is precision of applying chemicals. Um, we can do that by using sensors to detect canopy and canopy volume. Uh, so knowing the canopy size uh, and location uh, can then be uh, utilized to direct the uh, direct the direction and the amount of chemical you're putting out to be more precise and, and less wasteful. Uh, ultrasonic sensing, sensing systems and LIDAR are very common for this uh, operation. Um, and I'm, people hear the term LIDAR quite a bit. This GIF here, which is uh, shown here with the line rotating, this is kind of a simple ver uh, uh, visual of what LIDAR is. It's a laser, it comes out, it hits a rotating mirror, and that laser goes out and when it hits an object it reflects back and the time it takes for it to reflect back, reflect, the time it takes to reflect back indicates the distance. So in this case here at the bottom you see these little dots are indicating where it's where it's reflecting back and you see it reflects back off the ball that's in the in, in here just on the side where the laser's hitting it, because that's the only thing it can see. It can only see what's on that side of the laser. This picture up here in the upper right is a, a LIDAR image of some trees. So you can imagine if you had peaches, pecans, um, blueberries, or whatever, uh, that can be used to indicate, you know, where and how much to put out on, your, on the field. Uh, precision irrigation also has a lot of applications, uh, you know, Fruits and vegetables are very dependent on uh, accurate amount of water. Uh, so variable rate applications can use sensors like this one here, which is a uh, soil moisture sensor that goes in the ground and it can wirelessly send you back information on what the water stress in the soil is. Uh, that can be used then to control the amount of water that's being sent out. Um, this is really a, 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 a wide application now crops and, and in greenhouses and things that but it's uh, getting more useful for or getting more commercial use uh, uh, development in um, some of the fruit and vegetables out in the field. Um, less wasted time um, where you could potentially sense a uh, location of where say there's a stress or an, uh, a disease hot spot and you spray in those locations only uh, helps improve the efficiency and time that's being utilized for going out in the field. Precision weeding is, um, is, a, is really a hot research topic now and there's several commercial systems that are autonomous or semi-autonomous for weeding. Uh, this, back, this bottom right so image here is from uh, Stout Engineering and it's actually a three-point um, uh, hitch uh, implement that attaches to the back of the tractor but it uses machine vision to uh, weed between the rows and between the, the plants in the row. Um, this one on the far left here, this little green and white machine is called the Dino and it's for, uh, a does the exact same thing as the Stout Engineering Weeder but it self-navigates so it's fully autonomous. You just GPS navigate and uh, weeds uh, uh, autonomously through the field. Replacing time-consuming tasks such as spraying for weeds, insects, diseases. Um, one system out there now that does uh, air blast spraying autonomously is the GUS. It's called the Global Unmanned uh, Spraying System. Uh, this is a picture of it over here on the left, on the right. Um, it's all fully autonomous, um, somewhat expensive. Coming, it comes out of um, uh, California, but uh, over the long term, you're eliminating a person and a tractor potentially uh, to do autonomous spraying. Um, there's also autonomous aerial spraying. Um, 
we are familiar somewhat with say like the miniature helicopters or quadcopters that carry very low uh, uh, amounts of liquid or uh, can actually do dry sp uh, spread dry material like this uh, system here has a little uh, spinner to spread dry material. Um, but there's also what's called the PICA or PICA uh, electric aerial sprayer uh, down here on the bottom right. Um, it's a fully autonomous uh, electric uh, plane, um, but it carries uh, up to 75 gallons, so it can cover quite a bit more uh, area um, for larger operations. Uh, management changes. You can you, uh, utilize this also to make management changes to thing to try things out, like going to organic production. Uh, you have, uh, say, this this weeding system, where so you don't have to hand weed, uh, so you can. Uh, uh, produce larger uh, swaths of organic production. Uh, there's other things like nitrogen management, precision management of organic pesticides, water and harvest, as, as we talked about before. There's also transplant systems out there now that are, I consider semi-autonomous. This uh, plant tape on the right here, this is a one row uh, just extracted from the system to show what it does, but you basically send, um, you actually send the, um, seed to the company, they grow it out in these trays, and then the trays are uh, full of this tape that's pulled up and then used to transplant through the field. And you can see it kind of operating here. So this is what it would look like, you know, as it's going through the field. And um, I think I go pan to the left there a little bit, you can see it's dropping the little transplants. This would actually be going into the ground. You could also then look at, you know, introducing new crops that can take advantage of all these new technology that potent you potentially weren't able to utilize uh, previously. So within the technological developments, this information gets outdated fairly quickly. So where, how do you stay up to speed? Um, one, uh, for if you want UAV updates, the FAA has a really great website. Um, uh, FAA.gov slash UAS for unmanned aerial systems, uh, which tells you all the regulations, policy certification requirements, safety, and that sort of thing. Uh, Jonathan Rupert uh, is a lawyer and he has his own website, J. Rupert Law, and they have he has a really extensive website on different technologies and, and what's needed to spray, what's needed for scouting. Um, what new technologies are, and he, he covers uh, a really wide gamut of, of information. It's very useful. If you want to keep up with technology in all aspects, you know, sort of a precision ag or auto, auto automation or robotics, precisionag.com uh, has a really good website on articles uh, about what's coming out. And this, this is kind of a screenshot from this uh, website um, in the middle of November. And you know, so some of the headlines, new technologies address seed placement depth. Uh, John Deere acquires harvest profit, provider of farm profitability software. There's information on DJI's latest uh, drone that makes spraying easier. Um, so, you know, very timely and useful information so you can get a, a good idea of what's, what's, what's happening. So in summary, I just wanted to, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, help that how an automation really is automation robotics and, and uh, semi-autonomous systems i think would be a sort of a total so um, it could help with labor issues reducing labor requirements uh, introducing new technology to take the person out of the system uh, which helps reduce improve safety of operations um, lots of stuff out there now that are sort of uh, increasing efficiency and can be also kind of viewed as precision you know ag system to uh, improve weed management, pest management, and as I mentioned before, also help in pursuit of different management practices, um, whether it's precision ag or weeding technologies or, or whatnot, um, new plant, new transplanting systems. That's some, something I feel, failed to mention is the plant tape, as I shown on the previous slide, is has a few of those in Georgia, so you could potentially look into that to see if you wanted to see how it operates. So um, thank you for listening 